Martin Luther called the book of James the epistle of straw, meaning that it didn't hold much importance in the grand scheme of things. Why? Because it's too Jewish. And he, like most other Christians, misunderstood James and therefore carried that misunderstanding over to the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures. But this week's Torah portion can help us resolve both of these issues if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and dig into the Bible with me in this 5-Minute Torah. Welcome to the 5-Minute Torah Series. Shalom, I'm Darren with the Met Torah, where we connect disciples of Yeshua to the eternal Torah of God. If you're enjoying these weekly Messianic insights into the weekly Torah portions, please consider picking up a copy of one of my 5-Minute Torah volumes on Amazon to help support this channel. This week's Torah portion is Shalach, Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 through 15, verse 41. And here are the three things you need to know about this Torah portion. Number one, the 12 spies. This week's Torah portion contains the account of the 12 spies that were sent ahead of Israel into the Promised Land. Out of the 12, all came back with a slanderous report about the land of Israel, with only Joshua and Caleb returning with a good report. Number two, Israel refuses to enter. Believing the evil report of the 10 spies, Israel refuses to go into the Promised Land, and God rebukes them and decrees that the entire generation will never enter the land but die in the wilderness. The people try to avoid the punishment by charging into battle without the Lord's approval and are defeated by their enemies. And number three, sacrifices, Sabbath, and tzitzit. The remainder of the Torah portion contains a section about sacrifices, the story of the stoning of the Sabbath breaker, and the commandment for the Israelites to attach tzitzit, ritual fringes, to the corners of their garments. This week's Torah commentary comes from my book, 5-Minute Torah Volume 3, available on Amazon using the link in the description box below. Many Christian commentators are quick to point out the strict system of justice found within the, quote, Mosaic Law. Quoting from the book of James, they say, quote, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. That comes from James chapter 2, verse 10. According to this understanding, if a person even committed a minor offense, his life was in jeopardy and he should be wary of execution by stoning or maybe even a stray lightning bolt. If this is the case, it would seem that the reason punishments under the Mosaic Law were so severe was because breaking a single commandment was the same as breaking all of the commandments at once, rejecting God's law in its entirety. Therefore, a modern evangelistic tactic has developed that uses the Torah to point out the fact that we are all sinners. Those who use it point out that if we have broken even one of the commandments, then we stand condemned by God's law and deserve death. From this position, they then tell the person why they need Yeshua, to forgive them for being a lawbreaker who deserves to die. But is this really an accurate picture of what we find within the Torah? Is the God of the Hebrew Scriptures a cranky, irritable, vengeful God who is bent on the annihilation of humanity? When we read about the incident of the Sabbath breaker in Numbers chapter 15 verses 32 through 36, in this week's Torah portion, out of the context, it would seem to be the case. A man is caught gathering sticks on Shabbat and he's put to death, but nothing is mentioned in the Torah up to this point that gathering sticks on the Sabbath was forbidden. Seems pretty excessive, right? However, if we read the incident in context, we can quickly see that this man was clearly doing something more than gathering sticks. Just a few verses before the event, the Lord instructs the children of Israel that if a person sins unintentionally, in other words, if he doesn't know he's sinning, he is to bring a sacrifice and he'll be atoned for and forgiven. See Numbers chapter 15 verse 27. There's no harsh penalty for the one who sins unintentionally. He simply has to apologize and make things right between himself and God. The person who sins with intention, however, is dealt with much more harshly. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord. He has broken the commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. 
That is Numbers 15, verses 30 and 31. If we have a full understanding of what is required of us, yet shake our fist at God and proceed to do things our way, then this is where things start to go wrong. There's a vast difference between intentional and unintentional sins. As we've seen in the passage above, unintentional sins have no real consequence. Once a person realizes his wrongdoings, he corrects it and then moves on. But if that's the case, why was this man taken out and stoned to death? It seems that picking up sticks on the Sabbath would be an innocent mistake. Under normal circumstances, that would be the situation. The person would be informed of their mistake by witnesses who saw him violating God's instructions. But in this instance, he must have been well aware of what he was doing and refused to be corrected. In order to warrant the death penalty, he had to have refused to listen to his brothers and sisters warning him of his violation. If we go back to the passage in James and look at the context, we can see that he is speaking to those who are treating the poor with indignation. Rather than treating everyone with respect, they are showing more respect to those who are wealthy. James tells his audience, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. That is James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. His rebuke is directed to the one who thinks that a specific commandment in the Torah does not apply to him and that he can therefore ignore that particular commandment. In some sense, he feels that he is, quote, above the law, so to speak. This is exactly the problem Paul is addressing to the congregation in Rome. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? That's Romans chapter 2 and verse 3. Some think that the rules apply to everyone but themselves. This is the type of person that both James and Paul are speaking of. They are not speaking of a person who makes honest mistakes or gets off track on occasion. There are times in our lives that we don't measure up. It's called sin. Sin means missing the mark. But unless we are pursuing sinful behavior, we don't have to worry about being at the brunt of God's wrath. John reminds us of this principle when he says all wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. That's in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17. Does all sin put us in danger of God's wrath? No. If we break one commandment, then are we guilty of breaking them all? No. Should we repent and make amends if we stumble? Absolutely. Is God merciful to those who love him and walk in his ways? Unquestionably. Therefore, let us relay this merciful God to others rather than painting a picture of a bloodthirsty pagan deity in order to point people to Yeshua. After all, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, not his wrath. If you'd like to learn more about the Torah and Yeshua's connection to it, be sure to check out my other videos beginning with this one right here. I'll see you next week with another Messianic insight into the weekly Torah portion. Shavuot from Amet HaTorah.